present Arch Obler Plays. The Mutual Broadcasting System has the pleasure of presenting the sixth broadcast of a special 26-week series of plays by radio playwright Arch Obler. In this series, we hope to bring you dramas full of the excitement and the meaning of plays told in relation to the expanding world in which we live. The play will be introduced by Arch Obler. I bring you a story, Mr. Ten Percent. To you who haven't had the good fortune of a liberal education through show business, trade papers, Variety, Billboard, and the Hollywood Reporter, might I point out that a 10 percenter is the vernacular for an artist representative who, for the sum of 10 percent of the gross, represents the actors, actresses, singers, jugglers, and writers who make up the entertainment world. This play happened because one day I met a certain one of these Hollywood artist representatives, and he said... Every time I read the newspaper, I get, like my personal friend Dr. Cowan, the eminent dentist says, a pain in my bridge work. Everybody congratulating everybody else. The Army, the Navy, the Marines, Churchill sending congratulations to Stalin. And may I note that when I wanted to send a telegram of congratulations to a very dear friend, you know what Western Union told me. Well, anyway, everybody has given everybody credit for winning the war, but nobody pays any attention to Freddie Jackson, namely me. Not that I want anything like a medal, since who wants to wear medals on the front of a sports shirt? Unless he's a peculiar character. But like my personal friend, Mr. Jay Walker, the eminent ex-mayor, says, give credit where credit is due, and nobody gives credit to Freddie Jackson, so now he's going to give credit to himself. Operating from Hollywood, California, I personally had a 10% cut in this war. I personally, out of my own pocket, you might say, contributed without even getting an $18.75 war bond in return, the sum of, hold on to whatever you want to hold, I contributed personally one million bucks to help win the war. Yeah, but Freddie, where in the world did you ever if get If you, like my friend Jay Durante, the eminent comedian, says, we'll keep the gab down to the minimum, I will give you the proper facts. Sure, sure, I know what you're thinking. How could an individual like myself who, due to conditions beyond his control, is forced to give up his office in the Taft building and now conducts his business at Hollywood and Vine under a lamppost Give away a million bucks. The facts, like my friend I. Eisenhower, the eminent... Well, you know who he is. Said, facts are facts, and I personally contributed one million dollars cash to the war and will prove it to you. A number of weeks before the recently deceased hostilities began, I am walking down Bryant Street, coming back from the RKO studios, and I am not feeling, as my friend B. Robinson, the eminent tap dancer, used to say, too copacetic. Because my clients at the moment consist of a prize fighter who studied elocution and a certain lady who used to be a silent picture star who Max Factor and Westmore and Cedric Gibbons all together couldn't put enough of that makeup on her face to cover the candles on her birthday cake. In other words, as my personal friend L. Armstrong, the eminent musician, used to say, I am strictly from hunger. <laughs> all at once I hear a woman laughing. Now... Since there's no one else in the vicinity, I come to the conclusion she's laughing at me. So I turn to give her some quick words when I see she is a character who is only laughing because she's feeling so good. And I see further that she is a blonde who is as beautiful as the sun when it sets in the valley over Warner Brothers in full technicolor. Immediately, I turn to follow her with, as my friend H. Kaiser, the eminent industrialist, used to say, strictly business in mind. But due to the fact that she is a very rapid walker, she was already turning into an apartment building before I can catch up with her. I immediately begin to ring doorbell. Are you screwy? There's no blonde here. I do not have very good fortune. No, I haven't just been for a walk, and I know blonde. Scram. Very bad fortune. Listen, screwball, take your finger off that bell and go home. I was beginning to get discouraged. Now, there's no blonde here. Beat it, Wolf. But on the sixth bell. Blonde, just come back from a walk? Sure, she's my wife. Uh, what did she do? Beat a small child over the head with a sprivulator? No, 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 it's business. Oh, uh, well, if it's about the rent, I, uh, uh, went that way. No, no. My name is Freddie Jackson, and I am an artist representative for Radio Motion Pictures. What do you take for it? Well, I, I, I'm an well, artist... I took a first aid course once. Maybe she can help you. Oh, Mary, Walt is here. Walt? But my name is Freddie. Please be civil about it. Mary, Walt is here. Oh, Mary, Walt is here. Absolutely bugs. It was big as a house and full of grape nuts. My name is Freddy, so he calls me Walter. Let him call me Walter Winchell. Who cares as long as I got that girl for a client? With this beautiful babe, well, who could tell? 
Maybe I could promote a fast deal on a stock contract and get back into business. But, Walter, I don't want to be in motion pictures. Right away, she said that. I don't want to be in motion pictures. Maybe I should spell it for him in big words. My dear Mrs. Uh, Sterling, I presume I got the name correct, so to speak? So to speak. So to speak. Let me explain to you why everyone wants to be in motion pictures. Walter, look. You're starting on a false premise. I don't want to be in motion pictures. Mary doesn't want to be in motion pictures. But you want money. We've got money. Eighty dollars. Eighty dollars? <laughs> that is a laugh out of the upper bracket. I am laughing because you are not talking about money. Eighty dollars, as my friend H. Morgenthau Jr. says, is not money in Hollywood. Uh, look, Walter, if I may continue to call you Walter, Freddy. Anything you want. We, Mary and I, are very happy. Hollywood to us is a place where we rest our hat. Then why not rest that hat in Beverly Hills? Eh, uh, Mary, you take it. Walter, it's this way. My husband and I are in Hollywood only temporarily. Make it permanent. If you will put yourself under my management inside of a year, I will personally guarantee that everybody at Schwab's drugstore will be saying, Do you know who that is? That's Mary Sterling, the new starlet. What do you say? Oh, Bill, you talk to him. Please, Bill, please. At this point, I'd like to point out to you that, as my friend Archie, the eminent bartender at Duffy's Tavern, says, I am the type of man who could take no for an answer if it is yes. Oh, look, Walter, it's three o'clock in the morning. You've been playing that same record since midnight. We love you like a creditor. But would you please remove the needle and go home? Let me point out to you still another benefit to be derived. Oh, no, Walter, no. Believe me, my only interest is to be of service. Oh. Look at me. I'm not a big agent like that old fellow with the crew haircut who married that actress. Or with a building at Beverly Hills full of bands and antiques. Or spread all over like the William Morris Agency is. I am one individual here to give you personal service. You sign with me, and conservatively speaking, like my friend H. Hoover, the eminent ex-president, once said, I will guarantee that you are there in about five seconds. I'm going to take you by the bank side of your car. Right, I'm going to Mr. Sterling. According to the community property laws of the state of California, half of whatever she makes is yours. You just put the record in the wrong group, Walter. You're getting out. Bill, no. Think of it, the two of you. A mansion in Beverly Hills. I know just a place in Brentwood, servants, cars. And all you have to do, Mary, is take a screen test. Mr. Sterling, what are you going to do with your shoe? Walter, I'm about to become a criminal. Bill, stop. Walter, listen. If I take a screen test, will you go home? Absolutely. It's a deal. Oh, hey, now, wait a minute, Mary. Mary, listen, you can't. You can't do it. I won't let you. Right now, you're wondering, I presume, what all this has to do with the million dollars I gave to the war effort. Well, as my friend M. Gandhi, the eminent Indian, said, if you'll squat a while and have patience, you'll hear the whole story. All right. So I talked her into a screen test, which was something I did not have any of. There is an illusion prevalent, particularly among young chicks who are... As my good friend Warden Laws always says, strictly San Quentin Quail. These chicks have the idea that screen tests are articles hanging all over Hollywood like streetlights. Screen tests, my friend, are very difficult articles to get. For the last time, will you get out of my office? Well, Mr. No, Brady. no, no. Those two-headed freaks you picked up, I wouldn't use them in a mob Mr. State. Brady, please stop insulting my clients. Your clients are an insult to themselves. Now get out of my hair. Get out of my office. Get out of my life. Screen tests are very difficult things to get. But as my friend Mr. Dale Carnegie, the eminent philosopher, always says, try and try again. So... The next morning, as a result of some very fast talking with this blonde doll, I get her to take the morning off from the drive-in where she and that psycho what's it has work, and I am waiting outside of Mr. Brady's office when he arrives after a hard night of gin rum. Good morning, Mr. Brady. Oh, no, no, not this early. Mr. Brady, may I have the pleasure of presenting a certain Mary Sterling, my client. Now, look here, you. I told you. I... Well... And who might you be, little lady? Uh, Mr. Brady, could you please hurry up your screen test or whatever it is you call it? I simply must get back to the drive-in. I left a fellow there waiting for a hamburger. Three days later, the screen test happened. And what happened then shouldn't happen, as my friend Jay Laurie Jr., the eminent comedian, says, to a stuffed cocker spaniel. Hey, Jackson, where's that dame? The crew's been standing around for half an hour, and she hasn't even showed up. Where's that dame? You will please stop looking at me in such a manner that definitely asks the question, what about the million bucks you gave to win the war? I am getting to the point rapidly. There I was with a screen test and nothing to screen. 
I immediately promoted a studio car and drove out to where she lived. The explanation is really very simple, Walter. I talked it over with Bill, and we just decided it wouldn't be right for me to take a screen test. Not right? Now, that's a fact, Walter. As we told you, we're just sort of marking time until something we're waiting for happens. And then we just won't be around much anymore. You can't do this to me. It's no use. There just isn't time for me to go into motion pictures. Thirty minutes later, I had them in the studio car, and we are driving through Westwood Village, which is next door to Beverly Hills. And exactly what are you going to show us, Walter? Until we get there, this will have to remain, as my friend General G. Patton says, a military secret. This is not, as my eminent friend Benedict Arnold says, a double cross, is it, Walter? Personally, I do not know where I am going. All I know is that it's very important to keep these characters in the car so we ride along while I am desperately beating my brains out trying to get an idea. Meanwhile, I'm picking out houses along the way whose owners are a mystery to this day, and I am telling fancy stories about them. That White House over there is the property of Ann Baxter, who arrived in this town practically penniless, and now is one of the wealthiest small women in the entire United States. Walter, did anyone ever tell you you have charm? We are now passing the house of Walter Pigeon, who is the type of leading man it is a pleasure for a man's wife to play opposite with. Really, Bill, I don't know whether it's charm or the padding in his face. We are now passing the house of Betty Grable, who was formerly poor and penniless, and is now the proud owner of three mink coats. For morning, afternoon, and evening wear. <laughs> Mary, this guy is apocryphal. Oh. He is a composite of a Damon Runyon character, a Daryl Zanuck character, uh -huh. and a Mark Hellinger short story. With the mention of Darrow Zanuck, of whom, incidentally, I am a strong admirer, seeing as how he is the head of 20th Century Fox, I suddenly get what, as my personal friend B. Crosby, the eminent priest, used to say, an inspiration right from the feed box. Walter, where are we? We have arrived. Uh, in words of one syllable, Walter, such as has fed small children on dark nights, where have we arrived? I am about to show you the fruits of motion picture labor. This is the home of a very close friend of mine. If you'll step this way. This is a slight untruth, as the house I am showing them is rented by a fellow who is no friend of mine. However, what I have remembered is an item in the Hollywood Reporter that said character is vacationing in Palm Springs, which is a long way from Beverly Hills. While Mary and Bill are admiring certain vegetation growing on the wall, I quickly make certain arrangements with the servants. Are you sure it's all right, mister? My good man, do you think I'd tell you it's all right if it isn't all right? Yes, but this is Mr. and Mrs. Cranzabar. Life oh. magazine, full layout of the Boston house. Oh. Terrific publicity. Zanuck sent me. Oh. Publicity, you know. Oh. oh, yes, yes, of course. Ten minutes later, well, like my friend Johnny Weissman, the eminent swimmer, says, there's nothing like fresh water to clear the brain, providing it is mixed with a little scotch. They are in the water. I am in the scotch. Oh, come on in, Walter. It's only water. I have also made an important discovery, as my friend Admiral R. Burr, the eminent discoverer, would say. In a bathing suit, Mary Sterling is definitely a double feature. <laughs> okay, Archie. What would do? I feel good. Hey. Hey, Walter, have you ever read Machiavelli? Is it screen material? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely, with you playing the leading role. Say, uh, how much does one of these swim things cost? Two or three options, and you can have one twice as big. But, Walter, what if there isn't time for options? Mary, you want it? It might be fun for a little while. Come on, let's swim. At 9 o'clock sharp the next morning, after I have practically worn out my knees, explaining to Mr. Brady how a very bad accident to her only mother prevented her from keeping her first appointment, at last, I had Mary Sterling in front of the screen test camera. All right, Ryan. Get that light over a little more. All right. Get the arch, boys. We're all ready to shoot now, Mr. Morris. How exciting. All right, Miss... Uh, when the camera starts turning, you start emoting. In other words, when I say action, you look right into the camera. Tell us all about yourself. Be vivacious or tragic or... Whatever mood appears to strike you. During the course of the test, I'll tell you to turn left profile of the camera and then right profile. I presume, of course, you know which is your right and left. All right, turn them. They're turning. Beep. 
All right, Miss, uh, Action. Tell us the story of your life right at the camera. I was born in a log cabin in the plantation in Georgia. My father and mother were not very well acquainted. The fact of the matter is, they didn't actually meet each other until I was three. David, David. Uh, what is it? What is it? Hold it, boys. Now, oh, look, beautiful, this is a screen test. It's got to be seen by Mr. Brady, and he doesn't like jokes on test film. Not at this overhead. So will you please behave? Hmm? Will you please behave? Yes, Mr. Morris. All right, turn it over. They're turning! Speed. Action. My name is Mary Sterling. I'm 21 years old, and all my teeth are my own, except for a little bridge with a light, light hair, a black eye. Uh, I like hair. Save it. Save it. Save it. Save it. Right then, I discovered that her husband alone is not screwy. Some of it has come off on her, too. Every time the camera starts turning, she starts opening her mouth, and out comes Fred Allen. Why wait until the police throw me out so I go home? When Brady gets the report of that screen test. Well, there were always other businesses, as my good friend Dale Carnegie, who's also very eminent, would say. Now, when selling you the stock, I personally guarantee that you're making the greatest investment. Plenty of other businesses. As they're almost at the post, I tell you, this tip is out of the horse's mouth. I get along. You're so sweet and understanding, Mr. Roland. Just like my late husband. Get along? Sure. But I don't sleep very good that night. I woke up to the telephone ringing. Mr. Jackson, you'd better get to the studio right away. Mr. Brady wants to talk to you. And he said, right away. Right away. Well, I am no Errol Flynn. In the movies, of course. Charging and wiping out half of the Japanese army single-handed. On the other hand, I am not a rabbit. As my friend Frank Fay, the eminent actor, would say. Mr. Brady wanted me right away. I did not have to go to see Mr. Brady to take his very sharp tongue backed up by the fact that he is a studio executive in very close to Chase National Bank. I do not have to go at all. Mr. Brady meets me at the door. Ready, my friend? I'm going to get right to the point. Friend? What was this? I'm going to hire that girl and don't hold me up. Hire that girl? It'll be a standard seven-year contract with the usual options. And I want the contract signed by two this afternoon. Well, don't stand there with your mouth open like a dead fish. Go get your client. And practically nothing flat I'm at the front door of their apartment house ringing the bell. Mentally, as my friend Dunninger, the eminent mind reader, would say, I am not there. I am throwing out my client who is the ex-prize fighter, and I am furnishing a new office, and I am being measured for a new suit, and I am entertaining a certain doll in a certain bar, which up to this point had been too expensive even on credit. But my fingers keep ringing the bell, and finally they open the door. Oh, Walter, it's you. Today I am not myself. I am a swimming pool salesman. I wish to announce the... The packing. You're going away? All of you deserve a merit badge for observation. Come on in and sit on the trunk for me. I open my mouth to tell him that she now is about to become a motion picture star and they should throw the trunk out of the window and forget it. When all of a sudden I notice that they seem to have forgotten that I am there. Tom? Sweet. Tears. Love. This, I quickly decide, is not the usual way for people who are going away together to act, even if they are not sober. This, as my friend Jay Carradine, the eminent Shakespearean actor, would say, smells like something wrong in Denmark. The moment has now come, my dear Walter, for a fond farewell. Will you join us in a warm Coke? I said, sure, sure. Although, personally, I do not like warm Cokes. Here are your drinks, gentlemen. Well, how about a toast, Walter? Well, you will excuse me, but I am confused. In a matter of toast, what is the occasion? If you could give me a small idea. I said that, and he looked at her, and she looked at him, and they sort of moved closer together, and he said, Remember how we told you that we were waiting for a certain event to take place? Well, this is it. Here, look at him yourself. He hands me papers. I look at him. Lightning hits me in the head and runs down the middle of my back. It's a contract. I have been double-crossed. Some other agent has gotten there ahead of me and cut my throat, and I am standing there without a head. Walter, what's the matter with you? Who did it? Well, what do you mean, who did it? Because you know what those papers are. Walter, the time has come to tell us the truth. Can't you read? When he says that, I look at the papers. I see that it is not a contract at all. It is military orders, as my friend Jay Doolittle, the eminent general, would say. Well, that's the special event we've been talking about, Walter. You see, I've been on convalescent furlough, and now I'm ordered back to my outfit. I leave for England in the morning. England? 
Bill's been fighting this war a little prematurely. He's with the RAF. But, but the two of you, you always act so crazy. I, I mean, so happy. <laughs> sure, Walter, you said it the first time. But then why are you going? I mean, we're not at war. Aren't we, Walter? Aren't we, Walter? At this point, since it's getting very late, I wish to make the following statement. I make it a practice of never discussing politics with clients since, as my personal friend Fiorello, New York's eminent mayor, says, politics only lead to Republicans and Democrats. Therefore, when this character begins to get controversial with me, I immediately change the subject and congratulate Mary on having such a good agent. This immediately leads to further conversation, and by 5 o'clock in the morning it is all settled that she is not going to see him off in New York, but is going to be smart and stay in Hollywood and become very rich and famous. So that when he comes back, she will be well established with perhaps even an Oscar or two on the mantelpiece. He went away. She came to the studio. And it developed that the screen test, which I had never seen, is positively the most sensational screen test since Rin Tin Tin. Who, as you will remember, is a dog. And so is not too highly criticized by the critics. And further, it develops that after a week of testing, the front office decided that my client will not be put into any small part in any small picture but is absolutely right for an A production, which is based upon a bestseller, which has cost the studio 250,000 clams cash. Your lease for your new office is ready, Mr. Jackson. I immediately began to put certain plans of mine into operation. Mr. Jackson, I just adore working for you. I really would. Certain plans. The suits are ready for a fitting, Mr. Jackson. Life, as my personal friend E. Gass, the eminent poet, says was becoming a bowl of cherries, and I am a man who likes cherry pie. It was very true that, unfortunately, Brady had hijacked me into letting my client sign a stock contract, but I had certain plans about that also. The minute she was in front of the camera, I'd go up to J.G. himself and point out to him certain financial facts of life. Since, as my personal friend J. Hyde, the eminent agent, says, 10% of a dollar is 10 cents. But 10% of $2 is 20 cents. Which is the whole basic principle of the thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I am on the set early in the morning of the first day of shooting. Congratulations, Jack. It is very nice. I sit myself very comfortably in a very nice chair they have provided for me, and I watch the activity. No, I'm not nervous. Why should I be? It's all play acting, isn't it? My client is in excellent condition. All right, take your places. It develops that due to certain troubles with the set design department, they are shooting the last scene of the picture first. When I hear this, I think this is very amusing. I wish to state that if I had known then what I know now, the laughter would have come out of the other side of my mouth. All right, settle down, everyone. Let's get a take. I don't dolly in fast, Joe. Okay, boss. Mary, when he comes toward you from the door, don't move too quickly toward him. Yes, sir. Remember when he puts his arm around you, you may never see him again. I, uh, don't be afraid to let go. Hmm? All right, let's have it. Quiet! 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 Roll him. They're rolling. Speed! I suddenly see that the leading man is in a soldier uniform. A British uniform, and with the arc lights not on, as he comes through the door, he's the same height and build as the character who's now in England. Action! It's a take! Darling... John. No. No. I'm just going around the corner. Remember? Yes, I remember. They stood there holding each other, and she is crying. A very nice scene for the female trade, as my friend A. Green of Variety says. Have you everything? Razors, chocolate bars, your muffler, needles, buttons. Oh, John. What is it? Thread. I forgot thread. Oh, come now. Let the war department furnish me something. You're so handsome in your uniform. Sheer prejudice. You look... You... Oh, John. Darling. I told myself this wouldn't happen. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. It's all right, darling. No, it isn't. You're doing what you want to do, but I'm not, John. I'm not. <laughs> the scene ended, and she stood there, and nothing happened, and nobody said anything. And since she was my client, I did something. Bravo! Bravo! You can relax now, Mary. All right, boys, get it touched so we can shoot again before midnight. Immediately following that, I get into a conversation with the very pretty little girl who was the script girl. And at least 30 minutes go by. 
And when I turn around again, my client is gone. It then occurs to me that this would be as good a time as any, as my friend F. Buck, the anim anim animal trainer, would say, to beard the lion in his den. So I go around to the administration building and ask the little chick who's the secretary in the front office, would it be possible for me to see J.G. for three minutes? To which her response is, would I wait? Which is to be expected. I'm in the middle of a very interesting copy of Esquire when she says you can go in now, which is most unexpected, since people have been known to wait for three days to see J.G. for said three minutes. I go in. Right away, lightning hits me again in the middle of my head and runs down my back. She is there. My client. Come in, Jackson. Come in. You know your own client, of course. <laughs> what? Why, yes. Mary and I have been having a very interesting conversation. <laughs> have you? How nice. I'm going to let her tell you what she's just told me. Go ahead, Mary. I want to leave the studio. Leave the studio? But what? Oh, oh money. Well, that's what I came up here for, J.G. Is the little lady's representative. Will you keep quiet and listen to her? I've got to get into the war with Bill. The war? You're not in the war yet. What's it got to do with you? She didn't answer me. She looked at me. I said, okay, for a man, the war, maybe it's adventure and excitement. Well, personally, I will find mine elsewhere. And personally, I think England can handle the whole thing if they just try hard with the lend-lease we gave them. But you, a woman, what's war got to do with women? You get a lead part in an A picture, your very first... That's like lightning striking three times on the same pinhead, and you talk about walking out. J.G., you talk to her. I've been talking to her for quite some time now. She doesn't think entertaining people is as important as actually being in the fight. I imagine when we get into the fight ourselves over here, we may get a new set of values for ourselves. Meanwhile, it's better to know how she feels on the first day of shooting than having it happen on the 30th. You can consider the contract torn up. Mary, come in and see me after the war is over. Just like that. The contract is torn up. At least for your new office, Mr. Jackson. Your new suits are ready to be fitted, Mr. Jackson. I just love to work for you, Mr. Jackson. Just like that, torn up. One million dollars. All right, I will prove it. Two hundred and fifty dollars on the first option is twelve thousand five hundred dollars plus double that on the second option is twenty five thousand plus fifty thousand for the next year's option and then I would have gotten a flat deals and maybe hundred thousand a picture two hundred thousand a picture did I say a million I should have said two million two million out of me personally yeah I will now give you the topper V E day so help me I got a letter from them yeah him and her I got it here I'll read it to you uh, <clears throat> Dear Walter, here we are in Scotland. Both of us on furloughs, and we have just made a profound discovery which we are sending along to you because we know it will thrill you. Walter, we have made the amazing discovery that there is a very large world, the other side of Hollywood and Vine, and so when the war is over, we are going to see more of it and the people in it. Like a personal friend of ours by the name of C. Columbus, the eminent explorer says the world is round, so we may meet you on our way back. But do not plan on any screen tests, as we do not think our grandchildren will permit us to do that. Sign Mary and Bill. P.S. We are going to name our first child Walter after you, Freddie. So, now you understand that every time I read the paper and read about everybody congratulating everybody else for winning the war, I get, like my personal friend, Dr. Cowan, the eminent dentist, says... A pain in my bridge work. I personally, out of my own pocket, you might say, contributed the sum of two million bucks to help win the war. Hey, hey, do you know anybody eminent in Washington I could write to? At least they ought to give me one of them purple ribbons. <laughs> You have just heard Arch Obler's original play, Mr. Ten Percent. The leading roles were taken by Bruce Elliott, Bob Bailey, and Mary Jane Croft, with Everett Allen, Earl Ross, Roseanne Murray, Evelyn Scott, Harold Cornsweet, and Harry Lang. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>